Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. Today, here on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about book one of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Did I say that the way you would want me to say it, Carl? That's how I would say it. And all I have to say is, finally, you know, <laughs> finally getting to Aristotle. Aristotle is a huge deal. He's the hugest of possible deals, I think. He is on my list of smartest people ever. Who else is on that list? Newton, except he was crazy. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you got any candidates? Um, Aristotle, St. Thomas, and then there's like all the also rands. I mean, <laughs> n- no, nobody else even. I don't know. Maybe maybe Newton. Newton was really weird. Different kind of intellect, isn't it? Yeah. So like Leibniz says, hey, guess what? I invented calculus and publishes it. And Newton says, oh, that? I did that a couple of years ago. It was in my drawer. Right. And everybody believed him because, of course, it was true. Um Aquinas would have four or five scribes working at once and would dictate to them, you know, just go from one question to another question. He'd have like four questions running in his head. And he, it's, uh, uh, these are some amazing people. Aristotle, if he had only invented logic or at least discovered the rules of logic, that would be a huge thing. That would be enough. Yeah. Right. But not only that, but, Ethics. This is the first ethics book treating uh, human behavior as a science. You know, how ought we to live? If he'd only invented ethics, that would be enough. Rhetoric. Uh, what else did he do? Politics. Physics. Metaphysics. Metaphysics. I guess categories and all falls under all that. We're getting on that work on logic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he's a complete person. He had a theory about everything. He wrote about biology. He wrote about astronomy. Physics, metaphysics, I mean, everything. There's nothing yeah. he left untouched. He, he seems like this intimidating figure that you can't get into. No, 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 not at all. And it's not true. His, What we have of his books are probably largely lecture notes. We can't really confirm that, but they are, how would you say that? It's they like abbreviated. Taught. They are taught. There are no T A U T, not T-A-U-G-H-T, yes. but they are taught with the G-H as well. It's a skeleton, and there's not a lot of flesh on the on the bones but the bones are there his school was in the lyceum which is some part of athens and his school was called the peripatetic school which is uh, a greek word meaning they walked around yep so they would walk around this grove and talk and somebody took notes maybe and they discovered these so he used to write i'm just going to give a little backstory there are dialogues that Aristotle wrote. We do not have them. Cicero says they were better than Plato's. I have no doubt. However, it's like a detective story. At some point, somebody found a bunch of Aristotle buried out in the desert. I don't know. Somewhere they found a whole bunch of Aristotle's treatises. And books being expensive, they copied those and not the dialogues because the treatises were better. Right. Even though stylistically, they're not polished as much because they weren't public documents the chance that we have all of this stuff uh you could have all just been lost but super smart very very influential thomas aquinas calls him the philosopher Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people would rely on his authority uh, but that's not what he does what he does is he says let's figure out what we're talking about let's figure out what everybody says and let's try to find what the truth of the matter is he's very respectful of common opinion of what everybody thinks about stuff Yep, he's the best at making the steel man argument. You know, he takes his opponents and makes their case early in all, in almost all of his books. He makes their case for them very, very well. Mm-hmm. He helped me understand the forms better than Plato did. <laughs> yeah, is that the beginning of metaphysics? Is that where that is? I think. Well, there's a bit of it here where he says, you know, what what good is the idea of the good to a farmer? Yep. And I have to say, yeah, yeah, because I, I, I lean Platonist. He's saying, well, but the idea of the good turns out to be something that you could never know or something divine or something of no use to you. In other words, it gets kind of mystical. 
and I wrote in my notes, guilty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> If He's right about that. If you're a little platonic, I'm a little Aristotelian, I think. I love him so much. Yeah. I think they're both on the same team, though, ultimately. I thought I would read the first three or four or five sentences of this thing. Sure. That might be all we get to. <laughs> right. But just because I want people that have never read him to know what it's like and to know that it's not as hairy and difficult as you might think. And there's a lot in it, but just listen. Every art and every inquiry... And similarly, every action and choice is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. But a certain difference is found among ends. Some are activities and others are products apart from the activities that produce them. Where there are ends apart from the actions, it is the nature of the products to be better than the activities. So... He's kind of theoretical here, but then being Aristotle and being awesome, he's going to give us some examples. Now, as there are many actions, arts, and sciences, their ends also are many. The end of the medical art is health, that of shipbuilding, a vessel, that of strategy, victory, that of economics, wealth. But where such arts fall under a single capacity, as bridle making and the other arts concerned with the equipment of horses fall under the art of riding, and this and every military action under strategy, in the same way other arts fall under yet others. In all of these, the ends of the master arts are to be preferred to all the subordinate ends, for it is for the sake of the former that the latter are pursued. It makes no difference whether the activities themselves are the ends of the actions or something else apart from the activities, as in the case of the sciences just mentioned. So there's a lot there. It all, the whole damn thing hinges on this paragraph right and also the stuff that's in here once you think about it you're going to say my gosh that's obvious yeah it's obvious but you didn't think of it right you know uh every so the first we start with the definition of the good or at least a, an outline of the good the good is that which everything aims at so if you remember from socrates saying are things pious because the gods love them or do the gods love them because they're pious hmm. Are things good because we aim at them, or do we do actions because they aim at the good? And Scott just shook his head when I said the first part, so he should tell you what he thinks. I think I think that the good is a priori. It exists, and mm -hmm. it's something we aim at. It's not a utilitarian thing. We didn't we didn't just say it was good because we all want it. We all want it because it's good. And it is the motivation behind everything. He goes on to describe a little more about what good yeah. is later, but it's the motivation by every, behind everything. My friend Carl told me that <laughs> everything aims at the good. He says even smokers smoke yeah. in pursuit of the good. He says they don't smoke because they want cancer. They smoke because they want the stimulant effect of the nicotine and the comfort they get from the habit and so on. So even the uh, malevolent things we do are actually done in pursuit of the good. Uh, oh, smoking is not malevolent. Oh. Even the murderer is aiming at the good. We would say in the wrong way. He's seeking justice or something, you know, some kind of restitution that he thinks is owed him or, you know, it, but it, yep. it's a good, but done in the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. He actually says here uh, that people pursue the good for, well, for all who are not maimed as regards excellence. So there are people whose minds are broken who aren't able to uh, pursue the good. Yeah. Someday we're going to read Dostoevsky, and then we can talk about spite and whether that call <sighs> falls under this. But that'll be like 10 years from now. Right. Yeah. Because it's going to take me that long to finish it. I had a thought the other day. I was thinking, we're going to keep doing this podcast. What if we get to the end? <laughs> We'll figure it out when we get there. What, what if we read all the books? <laughs> Be like, welcome to the Online Great Books podcast. We're done. There's a, there's a restaurant at the end of the book list. <laughs> uh, and then, so the good is, we're, we're going to have to figure out what the good is. Uh, it would be a good start to figure out what the good is because every other action is aimed at that. Just to get you clarity. Thomas, who is a fantastic commentator on Aristotle, I have a few of them on my shelf, he's a marvelous commentator, uh, says that the end, the good, is first in intention, last in execution. Yeah, if you want to be an excellent rider of horses, 
you have to have the bridle, you have to have the saddle, you have to have the horse, and then you have to practice. And the last thing that happens is the excellence in the horse riding. Yeah, but it's the first thing you wanted. You saw somebody riding a horse really well and said, I want to do that. Yep. Yeah, so uh, getting our goals first leads all the rest of our actions. It orders them. Aristotle is obsessive about order of operation. <laughs> he has this thing about posteriority and priority. Yeah. yeah. Which thing came before? Which thing was prior? Which thing was posterior? And then figuring out what things hinge on other things. Mm -hmm. For him, organizing the events and concepts in that way is crucial. And that's what he's doing there in paragraph one of book one. Mm -hmm. And then we have this very cool distinction, an obvious distinction. It's all obvious. when you Once you think about it, it's all obvious. Activities and products. Ends could be activities or ends could be products. So an end as a product would be a house that you're building. An activity would be home building or listening to the online great books podcast, mm. uh, which is an activity, which if we wanted to, is there an end outside of the activity or is the activity itself good? So sometimes the activity is the end. Like scratching an itch. That's a minor case, but the activity is its own reward. Mm. Eating a pizza. You don't need a reason to eat a pizza. No. He's rolling his eyes. Well, you, you, it always goes back to the pizzas. I love pizza. Yeah. I think after this meet, I'm going to get a huge, huge, decadent, deep dish Chicago pizza, and I'm just going to eat as much of it as I want. It's not my favorite. I like New York style. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. But I think I want to get that. It's like pizza soup. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a bread bowl. But then there's an order amongst the arts. So strategy, which I guess is the... The art of a general. A strategos is a general. And the goal is victory. But there are all sorts of arts underneath that. So Eisenhower, before D-Day, is doing... The number one goal is victory in Europe. But he's got to have all sorts of people getting the ships ready and getting everybody supplied and getting ammunition and getting people trained, getting all of those parts working together. All of those separate arts contribute to the main art. If you think about activities that way, it could be useful to you. And it's just clarifying. Why am I doing this? Well, you're doing it because it contributes to the main thing. And the main thing is always pursuit of good. Yeah. The good. The good. Not good. The good. Mm-hmm. Well, he, what is it? Well, it's that thing which is desirable in and of itself for its own sake. In a complete life. Right. The bridle for the horse, the for the equestrian, isn't good in and of itself. There probably are some weirdos that are bridle collectors who no, <laughs> don't own horses. But for healthy people who are not maimed in regard of excellence, as Aristotle <laughs> said, they would collect that thing for a separate end. And even the horse riding to be an excellent equestrian would not actually be its ultimate end. The final cause. It would be for the happiness in achieving excellence that the rider ultimately does the thing. Yeah, happiness is the end of the line. Yeah, spoilers. <laughs> the horseman is riding because, uh, this is a terrible expression in English, but it makes him happy. Mm -hmm. I hate that word in English, happy. Happy is not the right word. I told John I would invoke him in our podcast. Our friend John Pascarella could talk about this. But happiness is not the correct it's as well as we could do for what Aristotle's talking about. Because in English, happiness means a smile on your face. It is related to the word happen. Mm. So you're walking down the street and you find a $20 bill and you're happy because something happened to you, but you didn't make it happen. For me, the biggest thing, so there, in understanding Aristotle, and Thomas Aquinas pointed this out to me, it took me a while to figure it out because he's smarter than I am. You have a separation between products and activities. Happiness turns out to be, in the end, spoiler alert, an activity, not a product. Mm. And once you get that, everything else starts to make sense. Happiness is not a state of contentment. Happiness is action in accord with virtue. And because we're humans, rational activity in accord with virtue. Getting the cart ahead of the horse here, but if you know that, this will start to make more sense. Mm. 
And so if John Pascarella was here, we would say all this happiness we're talking about in the Greek, that's eudaimonia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that, they have a, they're like Eskimos and all their words for snow. <laughs> they had all, a bunch more words for good feelings. Yeah. They have a bunch of words for love too. Yeah. Which is interesting. If you have, you know, a spare, some spare time, you could learn ancient Greek. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at uh, paragraph two or section two of book one. So things divided into 10 books and then we have numbers. He drops a bomb in here. He does. Did you notice? Let's see if we think it's the, the bomb is the same thing. Shall I read it or show you? Go ahead. If then there is some end of the things we do, which we desire for its own sake, everything else being desired for the sake of this. And if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, for at that rate the process would go on to infinity, so that our desire would be empty and vain. Consumerism. Clearly this must be the good and the chief good. And will not the knowledge of it then have a great influence on life? Should we not, like archers who have a mark to aim at, be more likely to hit upon what we should? If so, we must try an outline at least to determine what it is and of which of the sciences or capacities it is the object. I think there's already a bomb in there. Yeah, that's not the one I was after, but he's right. You know, I got a little debate last night in a webinar with a with some folks about progress. Yeah. For something to be progress and not aimless wandering and meandering, there has to be a goal. Mm-hmm. And nobody can tell me what the goal of this so-called progress that we have in our society is moving towards. Yep. We have to have a goal. And that's what he's saying here. Otherwise, our desire would be empty and vain. Yeah, you can't just have an infinite series of actions motivated by subsequent actions. You have to have a reason for the doing of it. He's presuming right there that our desire is not empty and vain. Right. That there is some way to human happiness. You can't have an infinite series. If you haven't, uh, if you think, if you had an infinite series of boxcars on the track, it's not going to move. It needs one thing that is not like the others. It needs an engine. If you have an infinite series of, I'm doing A for the sake of B, for the sake of C, for the sake of D, and that goes on to infinity, well then why are you even doing A? There's no point in starting if there's no end. Here's what I thought the bomb was. Every every sentence that he puts in here has to be in here. Every, it, it all hinges on every single thing he says. Yeah. But the thing that I love, 1094B, line one, politics is the study of how to achieve the good. And that all <laughs> sciences are in the service, ultimately, of politics. Yeah, that's another bomb. Because w what is our political process about? I don't know. I, I don't know either. But for Aristotle, he would say, uh, it's about achieving the good. And he goes in, on and elaborates on that. And he thinks that it needs to make every single citizen as excellent as possible. And that politics, the science of politics... The end must be the good for man. Yeah. So ethics is the science of, you could say it's more the science of an individual human behavior where politics is superior to ethics. Is it posterior to ethics? I'd say it's prior in that it rules. It depends mm. on how you, you set up your prior and posterior. It's above humans being political animals, which is also an Aristotle uh, phrase. We live in groups. Yeah. We make... We make societies. That's what we do. Like bees or wolves, except we're rational. M metaphysics. Uh, how do we know stuff? How do we know stuff? From the senses. Epistemology is how we know stuff. Metaphysics is what's... what... Do you, what do you know about things? What can you know about things, right? Yeah. And then logic is what do you do with that? Ethics is what does that call you to do? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you on a Sunday at 3 p.m.? And then politics is like, how do you do that amongst each other? Yeah. So let me, let's read a little bit. I'm going to read a little bit. This is at uh, line seven of the thing you just yep. mentioned. For even if the end is the same for a single man and for a state, that of the state seems at all events something greater 
and more complete both to attain and to preserve for though it is worth while to attain the end merely for one man it is finer and more godlike to attain it for a nation or for city-states these then are the ends at which our inquiry uh being concerned with politics aims so this is this is kind of a bomb politics yep. if you do it like aristotle thinks is godlike it is fine and godlike you're ordaining ends for your whole city what should human life be like and how do we get there yeah. which uh is a little different from i would say it's a little different from modern political action you know it'd be interesting to talk to someone who studies politics in this sort of modern way at the JFK school of government or whatever the hell that is, you know, and say, you know, what, what is politics and see, and, and see what they say. The art of the possible. The art, <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. You know? But for him, you know, it's to make the subjects good. So if they achieve the good, they are happy. So politics becomes the science of happiness for groups. And I don't mean English happiness. Who could be mad I, about that? Yeah. Rather than, I don't know what it is, balancing disparate interests and giving people what they vote for. You know, I, well, what should you vote for? Maybe the chief function of government, maybe, is to use resources. I mean, you know, I mean, the, maybe. <laughs> Like and you know, then you could say, well, it's for the common defense. It's for to maintain a judicial system. You know, you could say a whole bunch of other things beyond that. But it has resources, and then it has to fill these goals by using these resources. Well, what if we just stepped back and said, okay, we got all these resources here. We have this art of the possible. Well, what if we did that in the service of trying mm -hmm. to make all of our people good and excellent and happy? Yeah, well, then you need to figure out what you mean by good and excellent and happy and try to clear that up a bit. And that's going to be where you'll get the fight. He does it. You know, you could argue about his 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 definitions of happiness and excellence and all that. Then we'll get in here, get into here in a little bit. Uh, but he's making a run at it. Well, Carl, I have a question for you. Uh oh, can a state be what? good if the subjects aren't good? I don't think so. What did Madison say about the Constitution? Right. This is a Constitution for a good people. And if you're not, you know, somebody's got to enforce it, right? Somebody has to keep the laws. Somebody has to keep you on track. And if the people are not on board, they won't do it. And Politics may be in charge of ethics, but without ethics, you don't have politics. Two sides to a single coin, I think. I want to make a... A verbal note here. So ethics mm. is Greek for habits. I have a bad drug ethics. Mores in Latin is Latin for habits. So when people use the word moral and ethical to mean different things, I don't think they do. They're just the Latin version of that word and then the Greek version of that word. So you could say it without morals, politics is not possible, even though politics might have a whole lot to do with morals in the mind of carl yes but in the mind of carl are there is there no distinction between the word moral and the word ethic <laughs> uh i think in english in what year is it current year 2019 in the united states uh people attach the word moral to religious values and i say values because i don't mean i mean it that i mean to say values uh, and then ethics mm. gets attached to mm. legal things. So if you have an ethics officer in your company, he's a lawyer or she's a lawyer, where you don't have a morals officer. If you had a morals officer, it'd be like at, uh, what was that, oil company? <laughs> Tiger Oil. Uh, Tiger Oil might have a morals officer to make sure that people weren't swearing in the office. We need one at OGB. You know, <laughs> a morals officer? In my mind. Uh, morals are normative. There are some cultures where nude beaches are a, a big nothing burger, and there are other places where they would create enormous outrage. But ethics are objective. A lot of people don't like that. Okay, I'll go with that. 
I don't care what they don't like. If you continue reading ethics here, he tells us why he has an objective ethics and how you can figure out what ethical behavior is. He has a calculus for it. Yeah, either we're right about because yeah. I agree. Either we're right or we're wrong. So if we're wrong, how are we wrong? Are there any sections you don't like? Come on. No. Okay. No. Section three is legendary, though. <laughs> It's about methodology. And I, I had this open on my Instagram and I, I was showing people I was reading Aristotle at the Starbucks. It was the best coffee I could find in the city. And I have written, <laughs> but my exception. <laughs> and somebody asked me on Instagram, what does that note mean? And uh, I said, well, that's a private note from me to me. Uh, because what happens in an ethics class or in a discussion about any of this, you make some sort of claim, a universal claim about human behavior, and somebody says... Oh, but you should lie if you're hiding the so-and-so from the other so-and-sos, and then it would... Shut up. Right. In bioethics, you find the one case, you know... You... What about the guy who at the end of his life, his organs are shutting down? It, it, you'll go find that like, difficult cases make hard law. Isn't that an expression? You find the biggest exception you can, and you think, if I found one exception, I've disproven it. Now, this works in math. If you could find a case where 2 plus 2 does not equal 4, then yep. you've disproven that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But that is the sort of science it is. Let me read the first sentence here. Our discussion will be adequate if it has as much clearness as the subject matter admits of, for precision is not to be sought for alike in all discussions any more than in all the products of the crass. Now, fine and just actions which political science investigates exhibit much variety and fluctuation so that they may be thought to exist only by convention and not by nature. And goods also exhibit a similar fluctuation because they bring harm to many people. For before now men have been undone by reason of their wealth and others by reason of their courage. We must be content, then, in speaking of such subjects and with such premises to indicate the truth roughly and in outline and speaking about things which are only for the most part true and with premises of the same time to reach conclusions which are no better. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. So because there is a variety of situations of life, there's something like 7 billion people on the planet, so there's 7 billion situations, and there's going to be variation. That does not mean yep. that there's no such thing as ethics. It is something that's true for the most part. We would see this even in medicine. If you have an infection, for the most part, if you have a bacterial infection, for the most part, penicillin will do the job. Will it do the job for everybody? No, some people are allergic to it. It will kill some people. So do we say, therefore, penicillin, there's no such thing as penicillin? If you were a gamma, you would say, actually, and then commence to crap on all of this. <laughs> so what you're saying is, he's just not having it. And then he also later on says, uh, a young man is not a proper hearer of lectures on political science for his inexperience in the actions that occur in life and he tends to follow his passions. He hasn't really done anything yet, and his head is still spinning. Yeah, so he says, uh, we're going to talk about this as finely as possible, but as roughly as necessary, essentially. Yeah, I like that. Then, then he follows up by saying, and young people are led by their passions. They don't really know anything. So he's really saying, hey, guys, we're going to talk about this as best we can because the grown-ups are talking, and hush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when I was a kid, <laughs> yeah, when I was a when I was a teenager, I used to work as a land surveyor, and I don't mean that I had the degree or anything. I was the guy carrying the sledgehammer and the stakes out into the field or into the middle of the poison ivy patch, which they would tell me about later. <laughs> you know that was poison ivy. Oh, <laughs> but I would I wanted to be precise. I wanted to put that stake within a quarter inch of where it was supposed to be. And I remember my boss at the time. Charlie Dalton, who says, damn it, Carl, we're not building a watch. There are some times when you have to get it right on the gnat's ass. And then there's times when you don't. and it, Or times when you can't. And ethics, we can't. But we can say a lot. We can't say everything. Did Charlie ever tell you that you were rough on the fine stuff, but fine on the rough stuff? No, it sounds like something he would say, though. People that do things in the real world tend to talk like that. Yeah. Yeah, he was a good guy, but he did send me into the poison ivy and laugh about it. Are you ready for paragraph four? Uh, I am ready. Yeah, in 1095A, 
line 27. I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. I wrote a note here in my book. I said, this is what got him into purgatory with Dante. He says, a good is in itself and the cause of all other goods. Some thought that apart from these many goods, there is another which is good in itself and causes the goodness of all these as well. So he thinks there's a, a very, very highest good that is the source of all other goods. Yeah. Uh, we're only, if we even get that far, we're only going to do book one yeah. on this podcast. Maybe. We're going to do like half of book one. The Nicomachean Ethics, I think the capstone of it is in the end. It's in, I think it's in book 10, the talk of contemplation. So he says, we're going to talk about the kinds of life. Uh, we have the life of seeking pleasure. So we're going to see what everyone says. The life of seeking pleasure, the political life, and then the contemplative life. And he kind of shoved that, that third one off to the side. He tables it. He tables it, but he does come back to it. Uh, most of this book seems to be addressed to people who are going to go off and be active in their cities and public men. And yet there is a sense, well, what's the whole point of everything that he's concerned about? So that's probably why, why Dante assimilated him and put him into his purgatory. Popularly, purgatory is a bad place. But in Dante, it ain't so bad. He's got a whole lot worse for that than that if he, if he needs it. All the good pagans go there. Like Plato's hanging out there, Aristotle's hanging out there, and uh, the grass is green. They don't get to uh, behold the highest good. They're kind of stuck in the middle forever, but it ain't a bad place to be. So Dante Dante gives him a, yeah. a hall pass when he's got so many uh, popes buried on their heads and, uh, <laughs> and all these other people in hell suffering. Uh, he lets Aristotle slide, and, yeah. and I think this is why. I would like to talk to a, a little bit about the second part of that, section four, when he talks about habits, starting points, and first principles. We want to get to first principles and discover what are the rules of ethics, the general rules, but we have to have starting points that are known to us. And if you are not accustomed to doing good actions, you're going to have trouble because you don't have the starting points. These numbers we're giving you, these are the Becker numbers, I believe, uh, which are the numbers on the in the margins of a good edition of Aristotle, which means you can look at anybody's citation from anywhere in the world and know where it is. So this would be page 1095 of the Becker edition, which came out in the Renaissance, the B page, line seven or so. For the facts are the starting point, and if they are sufficiently plain to him, he will not need the reasons as well. And the man who's been well brought up has or can easily get starting points. And if you can't get them, then he quotes some poetry and says you're, you're pretty much screwed. You're a useless white, W-I-G-H-T. If you have had a rough childhood, you know, people are putting cigarettes out on you and uh, you've had four or five men living in the house with your mom. <laughs> I don't know. You, you fill in the... You fill in the details. You you have not been well right. brought up. You have not seen good actions modeled for you. You're going to have a hard time understanding what good actions are. You might even know them theoretically, but you say, but that's just not your experience. If all you've ever seen was the bad, you can't even imagine that there is a good. Right, and so to find general principles of what humans ought to do, if you haven't ever had that. It's going to be real hard. You have to have habits to be able to think properly about those habits. It's very hard to start from zero in human behavior. He says somewhere, habits or upbringing is not only important, yeah. it's the most important. Be good to your kids. You know, uh, you have to model good behavior or they're never going to be able to understand good behavior or they're going to have a really hard time understanding good behavior. He says, Plato was right in a, he's talking about these arguments and these first principles. He says, Plato, too, was right in raising this question and asking, as he used to do, are we on the way from or to the first principles? I just like that because he's talking about his old teacher and one of the old the things mm -hmm. that he used to say, you know? Makes yeah. It a little more human. He's pretty mechanical, and that just, I liked that. Yeah, there's little bits of niceness in here where you get some character, like, Look, he's going to reject the theory of forms, which Plato apparently held. I'm not so sure Socrates did, but Plato did, according to Aristotle. And he says, 
uh, what's the line? It's something about... He says, we have to love the truth more than our friends. Yeah. Uh, especially as we are philosophers. For while both are dear, piety requires us to honor truth above our friends. Yeah. I got to go back and read that whole thing. It's a, so he's talking about his, his inquiry into the universal good. He says, an inquiry is made an uphill one by the fact that the forms have been introduced by friends of our own. Dang it. But then he says that it requires him to honor truth above the friends. Yeah, and if the friends are friends, they'll realize that. They can hope, cope with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not uh, that you hate somebody. Disagreement is not hate. It just isn't. We're all trying to get to the truth, I hope. And if we are, then if I show you that you're wrong, I always come back to Socrates. Socrates says in one of those, refute me, bring it on. Mm. You know, he thought there, <laughs> change my mind. And he wants it. And if you can do it, it's a good thing. I used to do a little bit of business consulting and I'd go to these small businesses and uh, it was kind of like Gordon Ramsay, you know, going to these little restaurants and this, yeah, there are just some things that are so wrong that you can just fix a few things and everything gets 80% better almost instantly, you know. And I would hire consultants to come to my business. And I used to just pray that we had something that was just so wrong and jacked up that if we just made like two changes, things would get better, you know. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Dang it. Well, what do you, let's do – Um. so why can't – there's so much good stuff here. I'm, I'm almost – for Klempt as to what to talk about. 1095B, uh, line 32. Where well, he's talking about excellence and that excellence is better than other things <laughs> mm -hmm. and how you might pursue it. And I thought this was good. Um, possession of excellence seems actually compatible with being asleep, with lifelong inactivity, and further with the greatest sufferings and misfortunes. But a man who was living so no one would call happy unless he were maintaining a thesis at all cost. Okay. Yeah. So this is in the middle of a discussion about whether honor could be the good life. So we have the, the life of pleasure. We have our candidates. The life of pleasure, which he dismisses reasonably quickly. It's the life of the pigs, life of beasts. And then the honor-seeking life. That's, that's the political life for him. Yeah, so why can't it just be honor? Well, it turns out there's a couple of reasons. So honor is something that you get from other people. Yep. And other people recognize, well, what do they recognize about you and honor you for? Your excellence. So excellence, therefore, is superior to honor. And probably, he says, if you're thinking about it, uh, that you you seek honor to be assured of your excellence. And in maintaining that excellence is akin to being asleep or, well, or even dead. Like, cause well, I think there's a, a point here. If you, you were excellent to lose it. Well, no, but, well, I don't know. I always read it this way. If you have excellence, but you don't do anything, it has to be activity. Well, right. He says asleep or with lifelong inactivity. So uh, once you have the honor or you have the excellence, really the only way to keep it is not to do anything. Hmm. But, so it goes both ways. To be excellent, you actually have to do stuff. Because mm -hmm. if you don't do anything, you're not excellent. You're a tool no one has. But also, if you do things, you're going to make mistakes. You're taking risks. Is that not in there? I don't know about the, let me see. I'm not sure about the making mistake. I think it's kind of a, let me disagree with you, which is Dude. hard because you're my friend. <laughs> I think there is a, a, a level here of, of things. He's saying, all you people who love honor, what you really love is excellence. Mm -hmm. And you want to be assured of your excellence. But to just say that virtue, excellence is another word for virtue. So to say that virtue is the end is also not enough. Because you could be virtuous and not do anything. So good activity or happiness is going to end up being activity. Not just if you are temperate hmm. and uh, you have all sorts of virtues, you're courageous, whatever, except you sit on your porch all day and you don't actually ever do anything. Are you really excellent? If you do them, then you are. If a Carl excellence in the forest and no one can see it, was he really excellent? 
Yeah, probably not. Where he talks about the greatest sufferings and misfortunes that the man would endure is the part I was think that that led me to believe that you know mm-hmm. when you when you do, uh, you may have to endure those great sufferings and misfortunes, but as long as you hold this thesis in your head at all, uh, in, hold this thesis at all costs, then it was not for naught. Uh, and then he says, for it comes a contemplative life, which we'll consider later. Carl doesn't buy it. I think the thesis at all cost is saying just possessing excellence is the good. I think you have to do it. Okay, I agree. But only if you really agree. I do agree. I do agree. I'm probably projecting a little bit. I think that in the doing, if you are a are equestrian, I, this is, this probably isn't in the text here. I'm reading shit in here. This is not. But if you're a equestrian that we talked about, and mm-hmm. you really want to get better and better and better and better and more excellent with that, you're going to do more and more difficult steeplechase events and mm-hmm. push yourself harder and harder. And uh, in doing so, you, you take risk. Uh, you might lose that honor. You might not win. Well, let I, I think that is – I don't know if that's directly in the text. I think it is a reasonable – implication of it uh if happiness is in fact activity you are going to have to do stuff if you've got all the virtues you're chock full of virtues <laughs> that's our coffee like, brand <laughs> chock full of virtues that you you have to be active and you might screw up Im- implied in that is that you might screw up and you might suffer something but if you're sitting on your porch with your paps blue ribbon and, and watching the world go by and not doing anything, what good are your virtues? Are they even good for you if they're not active? So you might as well be asleep. So Plato apparently had this thought that the ideas exist somewhere in the world of ideas and that somehow they are the things that make things good. And it's difficult to figure out how. And so... Ugh. Section six is a question of some of these difficulties. Yeah, the forms. So, he, uh, you, you know, Plato, well, Socrates, at least in some of the dialogues, talks about uh, someone who is tall partakes in the form of tallness. Mm-hmm. And the one who is short, then there's some argument. Well, does the guy who's short partake in tallness less, or does he partake in a form of shortness? Or his nose is snubbed? Does he is no. Like, ugh. yeah, and there's difficulties with is is the form of man actually a man? Right. There's some difficulties in working out how the metaphysics physics work out, and I just usually in answer to that because I do think they're forms. I I just shrug and say I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> there's <Yeah. laughs> so I go read Plato the first uh, eleventy times, and I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. I get it. You know, uh, you talk about stuff like that Plato worries about all the time, or Socrates worries about all the time. These abstractions like justice and virtue, mm-hmm. and um, you know, we all have an idea, but darkly about what those things are. And if you're somebody that's coming to think about these things, one of the first people to starting to think about these things you're like we can't put our finger on justice we argue about it all the time at the academy Mm -hmm. and we Mm -hmm. we all kind of know but we can't put our finger on it where does that come from well it well we know something about it so it must exist but we don't know everything about i can't put a ruler to it and measure it well forms (laughs) it sure seems like a thing it sure does and I think Aristotle thinks it's a thing, too. So there's this uh, famous painting by Raphael. It's in the Vatican somewhere. I've never been to the Vatican, and I'm not sure they'd invite me. Would you go if invited? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I might have some words. I don't want to get into that. But the, it's a famous painting. It's called The School of Athens. You can find it on the internet. Uh, it's a beautiful painting with all of everybody that you know from the golden age of Athens is in that painting. Like Diogenes is there somewhere and it's fun to try to figure out who these people are. And uh, Plato and Aristotle are in the middle. And uh, so Plato is holding a copy, I believe of Timaeus and Aristotle's holding the ethics because these were important books to middle ages and Renaissance uh, Christians. And 
Plato is an older man and he's pointing up. And Aristotle is the younger guy and he's pointing out in front of him. And I imagine that the question that has been asked of them is, where is truth? Yeah. And both of them, for both of them, truth is a thing. But uh, for Aristotle, he's he's like, it's in the heavens. It's 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 in the land of the forms. He never actually says land of the forms. For Plato. Yeah, that's what I meant. For Plato, it's it's not in the world of things. Things partake in it. For Aristotle, it's in the world of things, and we abstract it from the world of things. But they both, I think, are realist philosophers. They think there is a thing to be known. Yeah. It's a difference of where. And in chapter six of book one here, uh, Aristotle does a mighty fine job of disabusing us of the form of good, mm -hmm. I think. He says there are all kinds of things that are good. This is the most convincing argument for me. Mm -hmm. He makes a l number of them. But he says there are all kinds of things that are good, but they're all good in a different way. The good doesn't answer to one idea of the good. Yeah. That's my paraphrase. It, which could be which could be wrong af no the good has to be understood analogically rather than as a single category you know you have to have good for all the 10 categories uh i like his line this is 1097a7 it is hard too to see how a weaver or a carpenter would be benefited in regard to his own craft by looking at this by knowing this good itself or how the man who has viewed the idea itself will be a better doctor or general thereby. So you, you climb out of the cave in the Republic and you go up and you see the vision of the good. How does that make you a better doctor? What was that vision? What was the content of that vision? Yeah. If the good existed, explicit knowledge of it would make your joinery better if you were a carpenter. <laughs> the pipe fitters union down the road from me, when they're teaching people welding, they would show them the vision of the good first. Right. I love the idea of that, though. You know, maybe that's what's in the briefcase at Pulp Fiction. The vision of the good? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he has another thing in here. 1096B, line 34. I'm going to back it up just a tad. Uh, if there is some good which is universally predicable of goods or is capable of separate and independent existence... Clearly, it could not be achieved or attained by man, but we are now seeking something attainable. Mm -hmm. So he's like, even if it existed, I, it's not what we're looking for. Yeah, that was the moment where I where I wrote uh, to myself, yes, it's something mystical. And then I acknowledge that and, and I'm, it is, <laughs> for me, yeah, it is something mystical at the top. I think that's probably what Socrates was talking about. That the Republic is getting onto the boundaries of religious experience, and that's not going to be amenable to this kind of analysis. Does that make sense? That's some high-minded talk for a guy that has two cans of curves behind him on his desk. They're the same ones? No, they're not the same ones as last time. Cor look, Chorus is, it, Chorus, it hits the sweet spot of cheapness and goodness. I, There's an I axis, agree. right? They partake in the form of goodness and thrift. Right. Right. It is a, a, a moderately okay American lager. Yeah. It's not Budweiser, which I'm just not going to do. Because you care about yourself. But <laughs> I want to talk about this thing about, for Aristotle, the good has to actually be attainable by a given man. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that's kind of sneaky, Uncle Ari. What if the good actually exists, but it's unattainable? Does that change his investigation and his project here? If the good exists and were unattainable, I think, then... Maybe you could approach it as an asymptote. Maybe you can get better and better, but you can't ever get there. It's, it's a still... I think you end up like a French existentialist. <laughs> Full of angst. And able to bemoan the evils of the world, but never able to get, like, it's like Camus' The Plague. Hmm. Pessimism. It it ought to be attainable, or what are we doing? There wouldn't be a science of ethics if there's not some way to get to the good. Now, not everybody can get there to the same degree, and Aristotle's pretty clear about that. Now, one of the lines I used to love bringing up in uh, in class was the one about ugly people. Yeah. If you are terrifically ugly you're going to have a hard time being happy and I, I would bring it up because people would get upset by that because they have an idea 
that everyone is supposed to be happy, but not everyone is rational. Not everyone is able to enjoy human company. There's a lot of people who are not real good at living. Yeah. I mean, isn't it like self-evident that super hot 21-year-old chicks are happier than gangly, broke, weird-looking 21-year-old dudes? Well, they get a lot more attention. I don't know that anyone ever tells them the truth. I think the world's kind of infantilizing for those people. Yeah. Here, let me pay for that. I'll get the door, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they, not, they don't have the same sort of things expected of them. But there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of scope for rational activity in a court of virtue, right. in a court of excellence. And we would like to have more of them, and that would be the job of politics, to clear the field so that people may be excellent. Gosh. I would sign on for that. Do you think we can get our listeners to vote for the person who would have the citizens be most excellent in their next <laughs> school board election? <laughs> well, I hope so. That'd be a that's a that'd be a damn good yardstick. Are you going to vote for the opposite? <laughs> well, if they get me the stuff I want. But are you wanting the right stuff? Give me that. This is where ethics gets interesting. So I want to do the definition as much as you get of. Yeah. This is a wonderful sentence. This is the Aristotelian sentence of all Aristotelian sentences. So this is in section seven. Uh, he's, he's reviewing all of these sorts of things about ends and excellences and virtues. And he says at uh, 1098A7, now, if the function of man is an activity of soul in accordance with or not without rational principle, and if we say a so-and-so and a good so-and-so have a function which is the same in kind, for example, a liar player and a good liar player, and so without qualification in all cases, eminence in respect of excellence being added to the function for the function of a liar player is to play the liar and that of good liar player is to do so well. If this is the case, and we state the function of man to be a certain kind of life and this to be an activity or actions of the soul implying a rational principle and the function of a good man to be the good and noble performance of these, and if any action is well performed when it is performed in accordance with the appropriate excellence, if this is the case, human good turns out to be activity of soul in conformity with excellence, and if there are more than one excellence in conformity with the best and the most complete. I used to try to read that in one breath. That's one sentence. But it's so good. Like, if we're going to live, one guy can live, and the other guy can live good, mm -hmm. can live well. Mm -hmm. Which of those things is better? Well, living to, well. To live well. And what's the difference between doing something and doing it well? Excellence. Excellence. Or read virtue. Okay? So yep. a knife and a good knife, what's the difference? One of them cuts better than the other. Yeah. One it of them fulfills and, its purpose. It's Right. And we could probably figure out the qualities. It, it's made of steel rather than copper. It's sharp. Yeah. You know, it has all of those qualities that make it a good knife. Those would be its virtues. I thought when you said you were going to read the Aristotelian definition of all Aristotelian definitions, I thought you were going to read this one. Ah, Go ahead. 1097A line, I don't know, about 36, 37. Now, such a thing, happiness, above all else, is held to be, for this we choose always for itself and never for the sake of something else. But honor, pleasure, reason, and every excellence we choose indeed for themselves, for if nothing resulted from them, we would still choose the, uh, we should still choose each of them, but we choose them also for the sake of happiness, judging that through them we shall be happy. Yeah, happiness is the thing you want for itself and because of itself and for no other reason. Mm -hmm. And what are all those things that go into it? All the things that go into happiness? Like the, the other things that you choose in the sentence you just read. Mm. You choose. Honor, pleasure, reason, and other every other excellence we should choose. So excellence, human excellence, is a big thing. Archery. Sure. Weightlifting. Sure. Podcasting. Right. You'll find none here. And but. so our, our objectors, or people who think that ethics is whatever you want it to be, will say, but that's not my happiness. You know, here we are reading Aristotle and speaking out loud into microphones that we're going to publish. And that's pretty good. I like it. It's pretty good. Uh, and somebody else will say, that's not for me. Well, no, you don't have to do exactly what I do. There's variety in human life. Maybe you're excellent at shitting on great ideas. <laughs> can you be excellent at a bad thing 
Uh, oh, gosh, that's interesting. No, you know, you can't be the best bad liar player. Right. But maybe your happiness is going to be, I don't like saying that expression because happiness is happiness. Your activity of soul in conformity with excellence is going to be turning perfect spindles for fiddleback chairs and making a good living and, you know, having a good family life. Maybe that's it. Yeah. So for Aristotle, the good equals eudaimonic happiness. Uh-huh. And pursuit of excellences funnels us into that. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, I think if you're not doing activity that is as good as you can do it, you're probably not too happy Yeah, in Aristotle's sense. And he says that this happiness is self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes life desirable, and it makes life lack nothing. Right. You don't need to check Facebook or Twitter. You can just do this thing, and it's enough. You'll just be a great cabinet maker mm -hmm. and a good dad, whatever, and you're full. Right. Human good is activity of the soul in conformity with excellence. Damn. Let's get on it. Let's try to do that. That sounds awesome. Now, there is some detail on this. If we want to figure out how to do it, well, how do you get excellences? That's the key. If, if it's activity in soul conformity with excellence or virtue, we need to learn a little bit more about virtue. You have to do. Step one, you have to do. Mm -hmm. You learn it by doing it. Is that step one? Yeah, but I, for me, step one would be learning about the soul. That would be what you would pick. <laughs> but he says you first have to do an activity. He says that the people that win the Olympics, they may not be the most excellent, but they're the ones that showed up. Yeah. You've got to show up. If you don't compete, you can't claim excellence. You must do. This is right before 1099A1. With those who identify happiness with excellence or someone, excellence, our count is in harmony. For to excellence belongs activity in accordance with excellence. But it makes perhaps no small difference whether we place the chief good in possession or use in state or activity. For the state may exist without producing any good result. And in a man who is asleep or in some other way quite inactive, but the activity cannot. For one who has the activity will of necessity be acting and acting well, and as in the Olympic Games, it is not the most beautiful and the strongest that are crowned. Well, he hasn't seen our Olympics. But those who compete, for it is some of these that are victorious. So those who act rightly win the noble and good things in life. It is activity. You have to do it. You, you are an it. athlete in life. Like our friend Sully says, athletes of aging, you are an athlete of life. Life belongs to those who participate. Yeah. You know, we said the other day on one of these shows that the internet wasn't real. Yeah. I got pushback about that. I noticed a little bit of that. It's not really real. It might be kind of real. <sighs> you know, somebody, uh, one of our one of our online great books members said, well, but what about online great books? I'm like, well, something like that could have existed in the past, but you would have like torn a little card mm -hmm. out of a magazine and filled it out and mailed it in. And then we would have shipped your book to you and then you would have gone to a local chapter perhaps for me mm -hmm. it's just communication stuff everything still happens in the world like we still have to have actually send them a book uh, there are actually people that have to organize the calendar and put the curriculum yeah. together and we have to actually have the similar people still must act when i say it's not real what i mean it's not it's the land of shadows there's a whole lot that you see that is not real that is uh manufactured images if you can recognize some patterns you'll find like nine of the ten clickbait articles that you click on were probably written by a robot right you know the one secret doctors don't want you to know you know that sort of thing it's not actual conversation if you use the internet for actual conversation then it's real it's real, and it's real just like sitting on the porch talking to somebody or using a phone or whatever. But most of it's, you know, most of it's not real. And doing things on the internet, it is not on par with the kind of activity he, that he's talking about yeah. here. You, we have to actually act. Right. I have a friend, um, well, I haven't heard from her in a while. She was a client for a while before Barbell Logic. She works in academia and 
Well, anyway, she's very concerned with a lot of things in the world, and she would post like a hashtag about whatever she was concerned about that day. And I, I mentioned to her one time, you, you know that that's not a real activity. It doesn't actually solve anything. And she said, well, I was raising awareness. It doesn't mean anything. If that is activity, it's the smallest of activities. We all know about breast cancer. We do, but it's not actually doing anything. When the Packers wear pink uniforms. Yeah, it's not actually doing anything. Not actually doing anything. And, and somebody would say, oh, 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 it aids in fundraising. Do the fundraising. <laughs> Write the check. We have to have a bias for action. Write the check. Do the thing. Pull the trigger. Drop the hammer. Uh-huh. Kick the butts. If it's about something that is affecting friends of yours, how about you call your friend? Right. Rather than posting a, a hashtag on whatever social media you go on. Call your friend. Go mm. do something. Do excellent activity. Uh, the internet allows, this is my opinion on this, it allows us to think we're doing activity when we're not. Yeah, you get the same sort of hormone cascade chemical thing in your brain as though you had actually done something tangible. Yeah. You just move some zeros and ones around. Carl, external goods are necessary for happiness. Did you know that? They are. I did. You have to have some money. You have to not be ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it says satisfactory children are, necess are necessary. Hmm? Yeah, where, where are you reading? 1099B1. I'll just back up just a hair and read it. Evidently, as we said, it needs the external goods as well. Speaking of happiness. For it is impossible or not easy to do noble acts without the po proper equipment. In many actions, we use friends and riches and political power as instruments. And there are some things, the lack of which takes the luster from blessedness, as good birth, satisfactory children, beauty. For the man who is very ugly in appearance or ill-born or solitary and childless is hardly happy. And perhaps a man would be still less so if he had thoroughly bad children or friends and had lost good children or friends by death. As we said then, happiness seems to need this sort of prosperity in addition, for which reason some identify happiness with good fortune, though others identify it with excellence. So happiness is an activity that includes and requires some kind of wealth and some kind of other things around you. It requires family and friends. It's impossible to do noble acts without the proper equipment. There's wonderful discussion of friendship later in this book. Yeah. That uh, it's really, really good. It's pro It might be the best part of the book, the discussion yeah, of what makes good friends. Um, I think it's a little earlier than that. But I, I love the, the very ugly thing. And you may say, if you read that, the man who is very ugly in appearance is going to have trouble. And if you say, oh, Aristotle, you're being mean. How much money do we spend on plastic surgery? There's a whole lot of people. It seems to be the opinion of the many that you need to be good looking to be happy. If you're very ugly, you're going to have problems because nobody yes. will want to be around you. Yeah. You need to be a, a certain level. You need to, yeah. <laughs> you know, non leprotic, no leprosy is a, it sure does help. Yeah. Yeah. And you might not like that. That's true, but it seems to be true. If you are you know, Quasimodo didn't have a lot of friends. We're trying to, have life and we're trying to have good life and we're trying to have excellence in all the things we do. And he's already said, you have to do things. We have to have the things and do the things that people are supposed to do and have. It all makes perfect sense. And one of those things, because these Greeks are really into this teleology purpose, right? The, the, one of the mm -hmm. ways they know things are by their purpose. Yeah. One of our purposes is to uh, carry on the race, Carl. Yes, it's a way to share in the eternal, actually. Even and bunny rabbits, says Aristotle, partake in the eternal. Yep. And he says having children is one of the ways in which we can become excellent. I'll tell you what, you got two dudes, and they're both pretty damn good. And then one of them has kids, too. Mm -hmm. who's the most excellent at life. Yeah, so he says, uh, we'll, we have to say in a complete life. And there's a, an interesting passage where he talks about, this is in 11, 
uh, do the fortune of descendants and friends affect the happiness of the person? Yeah. And it turns out they kind of do. So all of Lincoln's, Abraham Lincoln's descendants are dead. Yeah. Shakespeare's too. Does that somehow make him less happy? And I kind of think, yeah. Yeah. It ought to. I get, I get sad as hell all the time. I'm glad all of Lincoln's descendants are dead. I'll go ahead and say that. That's good. <laughs> but I get worried. I get sad about Shakespeare's dead end, you know? Mm hmm He had one kid, Hamnet, and mm -hmm. he didn't make it. I guess his wife was awful, but he left her a good bed when he died. You, yeah, we have the will. The will, and that's all he left her. <laughs> it was like a bed. <laughs> a bedstead. So, so let's back. I, I can't leave this kid thing alone. You know, like if you're a friend or like, let's say one of your siblings has a good fortune. That's very pleasing to us when our friends or our, our uh, siblings have something interesting or good happen to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. That contributes to our happiness. And that is an excellent thing to do is to share in that. How much more pleasing would it be if that was those good fortunes were to happen for your children? My best moments. So if Melissa listens to this, she's going to, she'll know, she'll nod. She should know. Like when we take vacations, I don't care really what I do. I want to sit back and see my family enjoying themselves, doing good activity, you know, where they're not fighting. My, my kids fight a little bit because they're kids. But for me, the the peaks of good activity for me are enjoying my family. I don't need to do anything. I need to see them doing great things, you know? Yeah. There becomes a season in life where you, you know, he says you have to go to the Olympics to win the damn Olympics. Mm -hmm. There becomes a season in life where we just can't do that. Like your dad, what is your dad going to do? Your dad's 83? Um, born in 38. 81. At this point, his greatest activity is to observe and uh, enjoy his children and his grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah, We I t I've been telling you this. We've been going over to play bridge with uh, my dad and my mom. They used to play bridge, and so we learned it, and we went over. We've been having bridge night a couple times a month. He is so happy. <laughs> Just and, and it's he doesn't even play the game. So what he does is Elizabeth plays. Elizabeth is my daughter. Elizabeth plays, and my dad helps her. And they're talking strategy and what should I do now? And oh, yeah. you played that well. And he's just glorying in the excellence of my kids playing cards because they're, my kids are figuring out the strategy and learning what to do. And they're doing, I mean, it, it's just a card game, but still they're doing excellent rational activity and he's just glorying in it. it yeah. It's, it's fun to watch. And then I get happiness from seeing him be happy at my kids doing great things. Yep. Uh, Charity's granddad, Haskell. Fine gentleman. He's still around. Uh, they live out in Adair County here in Oklahoma and had 1,600 acres or something like that. And uh, it's deer season right now. And Haskell, Haskell ain't climbing any trees. <laughs> He's not going to go get up at 430 and go sit in the dark and in the wet and in the cold. But he delights in tracking deer, finding places for the grandkids to put a deer stand helping them do that stuff and hasn't actually done the thing in 25 years at this point. But yeah, so that has become his activity. People are missing out on that. Uh, but you know, they got the good cubicle right now and they're 41 and they think it's awesome. Good luck when you're 70 dummy. <laughs> uh, my dad might listen to this, so I should probably say nice things about him. He's a heck of a guy. He is. He's our eldest thus far online great books member. And, uh, I remember he had a little bit of a, a thing. <laughs> he had a little bit of a thing and I had to take him, um, I had to go help him out. His words to me were, boy, I love Sophocles. <laughs> you know, it was, it was cool. So he's doing all right. He's doing all right. He's crabby in seminars. Oh, sure. That's also, he's excellent. Yeah. That's his job in there, by the way. Right. Can the dead be happy, Carl? <sighs> mm, no. Or Yes. No, because they're dead. Yes, because their descendants are doing well. That's what Aristotle says. Yeah. Do they live in their descendants? Well, it's a share of eternity. 
do they partake in the form of living? <laughs> you know, that is not a, that is not an open and shut question for Aristotle, and that's in yep. different books. Is there uh, such a thing as, um, and does the soul live on? This is an open question. I know we moderns are going to say, no, no, it doesn't. Well, maybe. The intellect's really, really weird. So then you read De Anima, which is on the soul, and he kind of thinks maybe it does. So maybe the dead are happy. But even if we don't grant that, then, yeah, the families. Uh, chapter 10 of book one is kind of mostly about how to be a blessed man and whether the uh, the dead are blessed mm -hmm. as, as well. I believe President Tyler has grandchildren living, by the way, speaking of presidents and their progeny. Hmm. Uh, my kids were telling me that, and they, they would know because yep. they do excellent activity. I want to look at 13, and we have to talk about this. So if you want to know about human excellence, we need to know about the human soul, which means a politician needs to study the soul, which right away there's a bomb. So the soul has an irrational part and a rational part. But there's the vegetative stuff that you do right now. You're digesting. Your fingernails are growing. Yeah, the irrational part he calls the vegetative, and it drives the nutritive. Well, there's two parts of the irrational part. So there's the vegetative part. Mm -hmm. Then there's the appetitive part, which is where all the action is. So your cell division is not a subject of ethics, but what you're going to eat today, how you're going to relate to other humans, the choices you're going to make, that's where all the action is. And he says this, 1102B13, there seems to be also another irrational element in the soul, one which in a sense, however, shares an irrational principle. For we praise the reason of the continent man and of the incontinent and the part of their soul that has reason, since it urges them aright and towards the best objects. Uh, but there is found in them also another natural element besides reason, which fights against and resists it. Uh, this is where all the action in ethics is. I know what the right thing is to do. I don't want to do it. That's the incontinent. It's not about your bowels. It's about knowing what is right and not doing it, right? Yeah, the incontinent knows what's right, doesn't do it. The continent knows what's right and does it, but hates it. Yep. The virtuous knows what's right and does it and enjoys and it. loves it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can think about that for habits that you have. There might be something that you do that you grit your teeth and do because you know you have to do it. Like for Scott, training. Squatting. Yeah. <laughs> he is continent with respect to training. The incontinent person would know that he needs to train and not do it. The person who is virtuous with respect, with respect to training, me, <laughs> 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 looks forward to it as a as something good to do and actually enjoys the doing of it. I didn't have to squat today, and I looked forward to it. You looked forward to the not doing? No, I looked forward to my training. I I, I just, it's the squat, man. Yeah. I just hate it. Ugh. I am merely continent with respect to my deadlift. Yeah. So, uh, but this is the action. There's some, you have something in the soul that, besides reason that resists and opposes it. And that's where virtues come in. So for example, temperance is a virtue having to do with pleasures of um, food and drink and sex. And those are all sorts of things driving you onward that could lead you to ruin unless you have virtues connected to it. A virtue then would be a habit of correctly responding to those desires, or maybe even of desiring correctly. Which is another trick you could do. If you could desire things the right way, then you're really in business. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, this whole appetitive or appetitive problem is one of the chief problems that Hobbes addresses in the first part of Leviathan. He, he says that man is this appetitive, uh, this appetitive creature. It has all these wants. Uh -huh. has all these wants, and that's where the problem is. So he sees the appetites as the driver of political activity. Political activity yeah. is that of the polis, living among your fellow yeah. people. So he, he agrees with Aristotle. So we were talking about um, politics earlier in a vague and general way. Uh, 
modern politics might seem to be the satisfaction of appetites, balancing appetites and satisfying enough to get you 51% or however many electoral votes that you need, that for Aristotle, politics and ethics is about desiring the right things. So I, I remember I had a... Um, I used to do this trick in class where I would ask people on the first day, I would say, why are you here? And they would sit there quietly for a while and I'd say, why are you here? Question mark. Oh, uh, because it's on my schedule. Why do you follow your schedule? Uh, because I want a diploma. Why do you want a diploma? Because I want a job. Why do you want a job? So I can buy stuff. You know, and eventually the trick was you get to the end. The goal is happiness. So the reason they were in class was happiness. But one guy wanted to get a job because he wanted to buy a lot of stuff. And I said to him, I remember, it. I said, this is a lot of effort. You're paying a lot of tuition to come to this school. You're doing a lot of work. You're listening to me on a, like a Wednesday morning. Why don't you just want less stuff? <laughs> yeah. And he had this look on his face like, what? Like We think of appetites as almost a, a monad. They're a thing that you can't deal with. That it's just there and you have to follow it. And so all you're doing is managing your appetites, but they're not quite that way. You might be able to want less stuff or want different stuff. It may take some work. It helps if you're brought up correctly. Mm. But that's, that's where the action is. is um, somewhere Aristotle says appetites, I think he says appetites are the rudders or, or pleasures and pains are the rudders by which you steer the soul. If you could just want the right stuff. Things would be easy. Yeah. And that's what ethics is about. That's probably the big takeaway from this book one. <laughs> yeah, there's a little touch of Aristotle. We probably ought to come back and hit the friendship chunk. It's book eight, book ten, I can't remember. We can look it up. Yeah, we may maybe we ought to do that. Go read Aristotle. He's hard on me or I'm hard on him. I'm fine on the rough stuff, Carl. I'm rough on the fine stuff. <laughs> but you can do it. Uh, you could do as good a job with him as I can. He lays it all out here, and he doesn't use very many big words. Go slow. Make lots of notes. Yep. Don't be yep. afraid to reread that same paragraph three or four times. Yeah, you you might have to diagram it out a little bit, but it's worth the time. Like that, the long one that I read, it's a beautiful sentence, and it is a complete sentence that makes perfect sense, but it's really long, and there's a whole lot of clauses in it. But mm -hmm. if you just... If this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true, then that's true. And you just have to keep all the balls in the air, juggling them, and figure out the conclusion. You might want to go to the conclusion first, and then look back and see how he gets there. It's not as easy as Harry Potter, but it's probably more rewarding. You think? It's not an easy read, but it is a very good read. You think somebody will be plowing a field in 2,000 years and find a clay jar with Harry Potter in it, and then we'll copy it onto dead sheep hides by <laughs> candlelight so their grandchildren can have it? <laughs> You're a wizard, Harry. No, I don't think so. You know, I one time found a note on the school bus. Yes, do tell. Somebody had written, like, front and back, real close print, on a piece of college rule notebook paper, this note to one of their friends. It was probably a girl had that loopy handwriting with the, mm -hmm. with the circle over their eyes, you know, and it wasn't signed. It was just fascinating to me. It wasn't salacious. There was nothing in it. I never figured out who they were talking about or who it was or whatever, but I found that and that was pretty cool. Can you imagine finding this stuff? They stopped copying all the other stuff. Yeah. You would think that you had found like an alien knowledge repository like, you know, I mean, like the smartest guy that ever lived and you just like find a jar with his stuff in it. Yeah. But if nothing else, just the idea that politics for Aristotle should be the art of operating the polis for, uh, to make the people as good as possible is heavy duty mm -hmm. and uh, is worth weighing out. So you re if you just if you just read this to see how he supports that idea and then evaluate that idea at the end of for yourself at, at the end of having read this, you'll have a much more fully formed personal political theory mm -hmm. to watch the news with and to vote with and or not vote with. Yeah. And it'll make you a more complete person. Yeah. And if not that, then what is the end of politics? Right. That's a real good question. At least you've got the right question now. Right. Even if you, you're not sure about Aristotle's answer, at least you're on to the right question. 
Boy, I love Aristotle. My copy of this book is a, it's like, a, I think I got it in 1995, 24 years old. It has all my notes from grad school in it. And it's an old friend. You get to hang out with really cool people when you read these books. The whole world is built on this man's shoulders. You know, this thing where you, know, you ask where truth is or whatever, and he points out in front. That's the thing. It's there in front of you. It's there for your sense data to apprehend. It's for your rationality to process and for you to synthesize new and fascinating and better and higher capital T yeah. truths in the pursuit of excellence according to your rationality. Yeah. I want to add one more thing on that. So I love me some Plato. I like Plato a lot. It appeals to me. However, it's pessimistic. Yep. Okay. Um, it's a tragedy. Socrates ends up dying. It doesn't really have the, it's, it's tragic. Aristotle is optimistic. If you believe in reason that the world is a place that it can be understood with the human mind, this all goes back to Aristotle. Humans tend to want to retreat into mysticism. If we do it a lot, uh, but the idea that the world is a place that you can explore and learn, it's Aristotle. Yeah. And he doesn't tell any of these damn ring of Gaiji stories about how dark people can be. He says, this is what you should be. Mm -hmm. Much preferable for me. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan. He's in second place for me. Second place. Wait a minute. Plato's in first place. Aristotle's in second place. That's so weird. I know. Isn't it? Yeah, it, it really, <laughs> it really is. Uh, <laughs> it really is. Uh, well, there's another online great books podcast. What are we talking about next time? I don't even know. I don't know either. Well, stay tuned and find out. Yeah, stay tuned and find out. And uh, I think we're going to talk about how we read next time. Okay, that'll be good. I've got people have asked, how in the heck do you actually do this? So we're going to talk about how we read next time. So if you'd like to join us, you can go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and since you're one of our dear listeners you'll get 25 percent off your first three months and if you want to save a little more money you can uh, you can join and pay for six months up front we give you a little discount and send all of your books to you at once no shipping delays uh, especially for our friends in canadia uh, that's a big deal so uh, you can try that out also please if this is interesting to you send a link to this show to your friends and uh, maybe get them to listen. And that would be a big, big help to us. We don't charge you anything. So send that, send that to a buddy. And by the way, pro tip, people that care about themselves, listen to their podcasts in overcast. <laughs> Is that where you listen to yours, Carl? Uh, does overcast have a Android app? It does. Overcast has this thing they call smart speed where it collapses the pauses but it doesn't speed up the words. And you can normally listen to something like around 15% faster without the words being faster. Uh -huh. I, I can't even hear that it's faster. Yeah. It's so good. And then well, they also have the little thing where you can just speed it all up too. So you can speed up the cadence as well. And it doesn't sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks. It's the best. I listened to Mr. Scott Hambrick at at least 1.7. <laughs> Am I too slow? It, well, you, you sound a lot more excited. At 1.7. And I remember Brett Vinat, our friend at the School Sucks Project, uh, he once said, don't listen to this one at double speed. And so I did. And he's really fast normally. It, that was a hard listen to hear him at yeah. double speed. But it makes you sound almost normal, almost Midwestern, almost like Chicagoan hmm. to speed I, you up. I didn't know I was slow. You're just slower than me. Okay. Well, there's another show. Thank you guys so much for listening. <laughs> Enrollment's opening. <laughs> onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast to get yo discount. Go sign up and uh, we'll talk to you guys in a seminar, hopefully. But if not, then uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks.